You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 282 by Rudolf Steiner, a lecture cycle entitled Speech and Drama, translated by Mary Adams. This is Lecture 5, entitled The Secret of the Art of the Masters, Annihilation of Matter Through Form, given on the 9th of September, 1924. My dear friends, We will begin today with two recitations that will demonstrate for you how in a poetic composition, on the one hand, an inclination to prose may predominate, or again the work may have throughout the character of fully developed poetry. Goethe gives us good opportunity for observing these two possibilities, for there are quite a number of works that he wrote in rhythmical prose and afterward recomposed in verse. He was from the outset sensible of the poetry of the theme and brought it to expression in cadence and rhythm. But when, later on, he returned with riper knowledge and experience to these prose poems of his, he felt a need to rewrite them and give them a language that was inherently artistic throughout. And so we have, for example, the two plays of Iphigenia, a German and a Roman. The German play is born out of immediate feeling that still has a considerable prosaic element in it. But Goethe, not being a man for whom it was possible to have merely prosaic feelings for such a theme, his language would, in telling of these inner experiences of the soul, inevitably find its way into rhythm and become rhythmical prose. Then later on, he gave the theme full poetic form. That was when, through an intense and living experience of the forms of classical art, Goethe had come to feel a need to mold his language artistically, to give it a plastic character. Today, then, we will begin with the famous soliloquy in Iphigenia. We will listen to it first in rhythmical prose, as we find it in what is known as the German Iphigenia, and then Frau Dr. Steiner reads the monologue. Uh, Reader's aside, I'm skipping that. Dr. Steiner again. There we have Goethe's original experience of the theme. And now we must picture to ourselves how later on, when he was in Italy, Goethe took up the unfinished works he had begun in Weimar and found them, as he frequently expressed it, Gothic or Nordic in character rather like some rough wood carving, strong and original, but without the perfection of line that is to be found, shall we say, in Raphael's paintings or in the sculptures of Michelangelo. And this finer artistic forming Goethe felt deeply impelled to bring into his own work. You will remember it was in the contemplation of Goethe's poetry that Schiller, when he was writing his title Aesthetic Letters, rose to that lofty conception of beauty to which he gave expression in the saying, In the annihilation of matter through form lies the secret of the art of the master. What does this mean? Let me put it in the following way. We can, for instance, tell something, expressing ourselves simply and directly, straight out of our feeling, straight out of our perception, that will lead one, excuse me, that will lead to one kind of writing. But we can then go further and try to find a form. And now we shall no longer have merely the original matter and the original feeling prosaically expressed. Now the effect will be produced not by these, but by form, by picture, by rhythm. In other words, the matter will have been vanquished by form. And it was in this vanquishing of matter, by form, that Schiller, as he came more and more under the influence of Goethe, believed he had found the secret of the art of the beautiful. 
We will now listen to the corresponding passage in the second, the Roman Iphigenia. What has Goethe done here? We shall find that he has tried to achieve such a complete conquest of the original matter by form as to allow the form to work upon the listener, whereas in the prose drama it was more the theme itself that left its impression upon him. Readers aside now, Frau Dr. Steiner reads, and there's the German, there's the English. Again, Dr. Steiner himself speaks. There you can follow how the poetry comes into being. The poet himself shows it to us through the forming of the language. And even as we recite the poem, we find we can learn from its fully formed speech how to develop and form our voice for its recitation. I must, however, warn you that if you take a work that is genuinely artistic in its language, say this Iphigenia or Tasso, and prepare it for recitation, and this will apply even more if you prepare it for dramatic representation on the stage, you will at once find yourself faced with a certain danger. One is inclined to skip lightly over the emotional experience of the theme and go straight to the more or less technical forming of the speech. It will, accordingly, be good to undertake beforehand the following preparation. Naturally, there is, as a rule, no time for it. Stage life, as we know, is lived on the run. Still, that is no reason why I should not explain what the ideal preparation would be. Select what is essential in the poem and change it back from poetry into prose, doing, in fact, the reverse of what Goethe did, when, from his prose Iphigenia, he formed his Iphigenia in verse. We ought really to do this with every poem we set out to recite. And while we are speaking it in prose, give ourselves up to the feeling the content awakens in us. And then, having in this way done our utmost to unite ourselves in feeling with the drift and tenor of the poem, we can pass on to the artistic forming of our speech in the poem itself. And we shall find that provided we are able to make right use of the powers we have within us for the forming of speech, we shall then quite instinctively bring the feeling of the content not only into the word, but into the very way we form the words. We must now at this point say something about these forces that man has within him for the forming of his speech. They lie in part deep within the human organism, those, for instance, that we employ for the utterance of vowels being down in the lungs. They are, however, mainly in the organs of the larynx. Some have their seat of action still higher. These last are the forces that come into operation when, for example, we use the nose in speech, and they are active also in forming the space at the front of the mouth and so on. When we begin to consider man as a speaking human being, it follows quite as a matter of course that we are taken back from speech to the anatomy and physiology of speech. And we may then be tempted to look away from speech altogether and take for our study the anatomy and physiology of the speech organs. What is there to prevent me from concluding that if I once learn how to manage my lungs and my diaphragm and my nose organs, then I shall be able, if it is given me to have any ability at all in speaking, to speak in the way that is right. Now, unfortunately, forgive my use of the word in this connection, a very ably developed and thoroughly scientific physiology of speech has made its appearance in modern times. On the contrary, excuse me, on the strength of this theoretical physiology of speech, all manner of suggestions can, of course, be advanced for the, for the management of the speech organs in speaking and also in singing. There is no difficulty about that sort of thing today. The strange thing is, however, that whilst in regard to the physiology of speech something like agreement has been reached, the methods of teaching singing and speaking are many and various and the representatives of each expound the matter 
in a different way and give different directions. Well, we can let that remain a little mystery. I have no desire to delve into it any further just now. This is, however, not the road that leads to health, whether we are aiming at healthy speech organs or healthy speaking. We must take our start, as I have frequently explained, not from the speech organs, not from anatomy and physiology, however well recognized and established, but from speech itself. We have to learn to look upon speech as an organism on its own account. We have to see it as something objective, detached from the human being. In this speech organism of ours, we have then to begin with the system of the vowels, from the very sound of which we can recognize at once their organic character. Now, if you were to describe man, you would, I am sure, find it best to proceed with your description in some sort of order to correspond with his organism. You would not think of saying, for example, man consists of head, legs, breast, neck. You would be more likely to say, man consists of head, neck, breast, legs. And here, too, we must look for the right order. The speech organism is, of course, always in movement, and the elements of speech naturally become intermingled. But we can, nevertheless, hold this speech organism before our mind's eye, E-Y-E, and contemplate it as something apart from the whole organism of man, contemplating it objectively as a kind of image or specter, if you will. We are not, you see, regarding man now in the way anatomists and physiologists do, who look at the physical body and think to have there the whole of man. No. For we are regarding man speaking as something outside him, though, of course, dependent on him for its forming. Taking, then, first the vowels, we shall find we can arrange them in the following order. A, A, E, and then there's a slash, O, A, E, U, U. For what do we have when we have utterance of the vowels in this sequence? A, A, E, O, E, U, U, U. We have, roughly speaking, all possible forms that the organs can take which come into use for the utterance of vowel sounds. In A, we have the speech organism wide open. It opens wide and lets itself right out. This is less the case with A. The speech through which the sound passes is somewhat narrowed. The A is, however, still quite far back in the mouth. The A is formed farthest back of all, and no forward part of the mouth interposes to modify the original elemental forming of the vowel A. With E, the space through which the sound passes is still narrower. It is very nearly closed. The E passes through no more than a tiny rift. We are at the same time again still moving forward in the mouth. We go farther forward and come to O. Here we are already in front of that narrow rift if we are forming the vowel in the right way. We go farther and farther forward, trying always to look for what is essential in the forming of the vowel, and come at length to U and U, in both of which the sound formation is very far forward. While we are going through the vowels in this sequence, A, E, E, O, E, U, 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 we have before us the speech organism as such, detached from the human being. And if we do this quite often, setting vowel beside vowel, carefully always to seek out for each its exactly right place, and not allowing one to merge into another, then the exercise itself will ensure that we have the absolutely right position in the mouth for each vowel. 
As you see, in our practice and training, we take our start from speech. This, then, will be the first step. And now we can go further. We can do exercises. I will presently give you some examples, which need not be clever or even sensible, since their sole purpose is to further the right speaking of vowels. Those of you who have already had lessons here in speech will know that for exercise we cannot give proper intelligent sentences. We have to give exercises in which each sound stands at the right place for it to find its way to the corresponding organ. Readers aside, I will be reading some German sentences and I do apologize in advance to proper German speakers for my attempts, but again, as an illustration, they're just short sentences. End of readers aside. Suppose you take for an exercise the following sequence of words giving special attention to the vowels. Aber, ich, will, nicht, dir, alle, geben. Practicing the sentence again and again with special intonation of the vowels. Aber, ich, will, nicht, dir, alle, geben. You will quickly be able to detect what this exercise does for you. As you do it, organ-forming forces begin to work in you. And you can feel where you, they are working, namely in the direction of the organs that are situated farther back. As you continue to practice this sequence of words, you will find that lungs, larynx, and even diaphragm are brought into a healthy condition. For what are you doing when you speak the words Aber, ich will nicht dir alle geben. You go in the vowel up to the point where the passage for the breath is most nearly blocked. A, E, I, speaking. So far only vowels that lie behind this point. As you speak, you press back, as it were, at this point of greatest obstruction, not allowing your speaking to come beyond it. By this means you exercise lungs, larynx, and as far down as diaphragm. For you first move forward in the mouth up to this boundary line, but then go back again, keeping all the time strictly behind it. You have in the middle of the sentence e, 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 a, a, at the beginning and a, a, again at the end. Working thus, you will be evolving from the speech organism no abstract physiology, but a physiological forming of the organs. We have, therefore, here, an important indication of methods that should be employed if we want to work beneficially on the more inward organs of speech. We set ourselves a boundary when we put the E there in the middle of the sentence. Take another sequence of words. As I said before, these sentences have no profound meaning. They are mere exercises. O shell und schmor voll mir mit milch nis zu mus. The words have very little sense, but the sequence of sounds accords well with the sense of a particular speech process. For here you have again e e e in the middle, and again you divide off with the same boundary line what you want to leave out. But this time in the rest of the sequence all the vowels sounds all the vowel sounds lie not behind but in front of the boundary. If you try to speak the sentence in the way it should be spoken, you will have in it all the resonances you need nasal resonance, head resonance. You will have them all. The sentence is spoken forward throughout. To speak well in the more forward part of the mouth is rather difficult. It can, however, be learned. And this sentence, once we have learned to speak it rightly, will do wonders for the health and mobility of the organs that are situated farther forward. O shell und schmor mühlvoll mir mit milch nüss zu mus. I want you to understand 
that we are here marking a practical attempt to work from speech into the forming of the organs, so that these shall acquire the necessary faculty of vibration. To get the best value from these exercises, you should speak the first sentence ten times, and then the second ten times, then the first and the second, one after the other, ten times. In this way, it is actually possible to bring about a modification of the forms of the organs, and that will be most advantageous for the right speaking of vowels. And now, let me tell you of an exercise that is useful for the right forming of consonants. I am giving these exercises now as examples. We shall have others to add as the course proceeds. Take the following sequence of words. Harte starke. And now, do not immediately continue the sentence, but make a pause with a, a, a. Finger sind. Wait again and say e, e, e. Bei wackeln. A, a, a. Leuten schon. A, a, a. Leicht. E, e, e. Zu finden. U, u, u. This is then the little monster of a sentence that you have to speak. Harte starke, a, a, a. Finger sind, i, i, i. Bei wackeln, a, a, a. Leuten schon, a, a, a. Leicht, i, i, i. Zu finden, u, u, u. What is the good of such an exercise? I was telling you the other day that when we classify consonantal sounds according to the way they are spoken, we have sounds we can call blown, in quotes, or breath, in quotes, sounds. And others that we can call sounds of, in quotes, impact, or in quotes, thrust sounds. In actual speaking, the sounds are, of course, mixed up together. In order, therefore, to speak artistically, we shall have to acquire a fluency that allows these two kinds of sounds to work harmoniously into and with one another. If we succeed in bringing this about, we shall find that we attain at the same time something else, namely that this cooperation of blown sounds and impact sounds works back physiologically upon our organs. And so, working this time with consonants, we shall once more be bringing our organs into right vibration. But now in this exercise, in between blown sounds and impact sounds, vibrating sounds are interposed, and also wave sounds. We start with a blown sound, ha, and follow it up with an impact sound, t. But in between we have the vi vibrating sound, Ar. Then again, blown sound, impact sound, vibrating sound, impact sound. We make blown sounds and impact sounds alternate, but the vibrating sound, ar, has to come between, and also in a corresponding manner the glide, el, the wave sound. Through the practice of an exercise that obliges us to alternate blown sounds with impact sounds, just in this way, we bring about a right configuration of the organs of speech. We have first to, to let out the breath, then pull it up short, and from time to time interpose now a vibrating movement, now again a wave-like movement. And an exercise that provides this alternation, here letting the voice come to rest as far back as possible, here going into the middle, then back again, then once more into the middle, and finally forward. An exercise like this, because it has its source in the speech organism itself, will produce fluency and variety in our speaking. And while we are thus continually bringing our voice to rest at different places of our speech organism, in turn pausing a little at the middle when we are there, at other times going to the periphery, 
now backward, now forward. While we are doing this, not only shall we be forming our speech so that it becomes whole and healthy, but we shall at the same time be promoting the health also of the several organs. You will therefore do well to practice such an exercise which allows the consonant element in speech to work formatively upon the speech organs. In the first part of our lecture course I am concerned primarily, as you know, with the forming of speech. Harte starke, a, 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 Finger sind, i, 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 bei wackern, a, 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 Leuten schon, a, 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 leicht, i, 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 zu finden, u, u, u. Here again, it will be best to do the exercises in succession, one after the other. If we call the first exercise A, the second B, the third C, then it will be 10 times A, 10 times B, 10 times AB, 10 times C, 10 times ABC. One should then pass on to some poem that gives opportunity to put this all into practice. Here, however, we find ourselves up against a difficulty. For it is not exactly easy to come across passages in poetry where vowels and consonants are arranged purely out of the configuration of the speech organism. Poets are not always such good poets as to achieve this instinctively. I have, however, found a few verses which do very nearly fulfill the requirements of speech formation in certain respects and can accordingly be useful to us. After you have been right through the exercises, repeating them in the order I recommended, and have in this way achieved fluency and ease in the use of your speech organs, you may then go straight on to speak the following verse by Kugler. Und der Wandre zieht von Dannen, denn die Trängungsstunde ruft, und er singet Abschiedslieder, lebewohl, tönt, im Hernieder, Tücher wehen in der Luft. This stanza, taken immediately after the speech exercises, can help considerably, for it is founded upon the nature of the speech organs themselves. The sounds are not entirely right throughout. I would have preferred, for example, not to have here in Der Wandre an A and an A but one cannot expect perfection. If you have practiced beforehand the exercises expressly designed to promote fluency, then a little verse like this will help you to come quite naturally into a right sounding, especially of vowels, and also in some measure of consonants. Another verse that can prove useful in this direction is a stanza taken from the Ausgewanterte Dichter of Freiligrath, Ich sonne mich im letzten Abendstrahler und leise säuselt über mir die Rüste. Du jetzt, mein Leben, wandelst wohl im Saale. Der Teppich rauscht und strahlend flammt der Lüste. Twice in this verse we come almost to the very front of the speech organs, and that gives the verse again the same character, that I was able to point out to you in the other. Compare especially the E, U, and then the O and A, etc. I have also, excuse me, I have found also, in a poem by Johann Peter Hebels, a verse that can be particularly helpful for exercising the speech organs that lie in, the, in front of the E. Und drüber hebt sie zuni in die Höhe und leucht in die Welt und Zeit, was muss ich sein in alle Früh? Der Friedli schlingt sie arm, ums Ketterli und zwölt erm wohl und warm, druf hat erms Ketterli eschmutzli ge. This is an excellent exercise for the nose and the other more forward organs.
It should be practiced often. And I recommend that in between the verses you repeat every time the whole series of exercises that I gave before. Thus you begin with 10 times A, 10 times B, 10 times AB, 10 times C, 10 times ABC. Then you recite und der Wandler zieht von Dannen. Then take again the above series A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C. Then ich sonne mich im letzten Abendstrahler. Then once more the series A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C. And finally und drüber hebt sie zuni still in die Höhe. Finishing up, that is, with this capital and droll little verse. And you will see your organs will become quite wonderful. You will in very truth be finding your way by sheer persistent practice into a right forming of speech. A is, Aber ich will nicht dir alle geben. B, O shell und schmor mühevoll, mir mit Milch Nuss zu Muss. C, harte stark. A, 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 Finger sind I, 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 bei Wackeln, A, 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 Leuten schon, A, 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 leicht I, 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 zu finden, U, U, U. The end of Lecture 5